Hi, everyone. I'm just admitting everyone. And once the messages stop coming through, I will, we can get started. Okay, sorry for keeping you waiting. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Vicaria. I'm the CSR manager of MudChains. Super nice that you're here. Uh, so the purpose of these calls is always, always to just give you a space to ask all of your questions. So we have an hour. Um, so the structure will be the following. Um, I will go through the list. And when I call your name, you can ask the question you would like to yeah, briefly introduce yourself and ask the question that you would like to ask. Um, we kindly ask that, of course. I mean, we hope that you have read the sustainability report and all of the other information on our website. So, um, you know, we expect a little bit more detailed questions, not so much how we are a circular company, but maybe more specific uh, type of questions. Those other more genuine questions you can find on our sustainability report. Okie dokie, let's get started. So, um, sorry guys, I'm just trying to get the list. All right, um, Adrienne. Adrienne? <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi, sorry. I'm not uh, uh, using Zoom daily, so it's a little bit uncomfortable. No. Um, uh, first, I want to ask uh, if I am in the right meeting because we should have an interview with the uh, with the man Bert van Zoom to ask him questions in a, like, a monthly meeting. Is that this meeting? Yeah, this is it. Uh, okay. Today. Okay. This monthly meeting, I'm doing it. Uh, Bert is getting his COVID vaccine today, so I'm taking over. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But uh, the, the other link didn't work, so I just want to check it. Yeah. Uh, I know that then another colleague uh, is not is uh, also waiting. Oh, she is also there. I see it. Um, sure. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm uh, Adrienne Langstraat, uh, working for the Ministry of Defense. Uh, that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm following uh, an MBA and we have there uh, a course that's called Maatschappelijk Verantwoord Ondernemer. And we have to do um, a company analysis. Uh, and um, yeah, in a sustainable uh, organization. So that's why we came uh, to Mud Jeans. Um, that's an interesting uh, company that we want to. Uh, uh, yeah, to uh, to investigate how it's organized, uh, why uh, we have sent our questions uh, uh, forward yesterday. Maybe you have seen them already, but otherwise we will uh, ask them. Uh, yes, I, I mean, ideally, I don't know what was discussed with you. Ideally, the way this structure works is is more one question per person. And then, of course, if we have more time, we'll go through through more, but we have 23 people on the call today. So that's that will quickly take up uh, the time of today. So, but please feel free to uh, send, uh, tell me your most important question and I will do my best to answer it. Um, the most important question is, um, um, how do you stay, um, uh, yeah, um, sorry, I have to, can you ask another first? So I have to, I can search my question in English. Sure, no problem. Um, Thank you. No problem. Anne Grubler, apologies for the pronunciation. <laughs> hey, um, my question is, what percentage of your revenue comes from leasing and what comes from sales? Uh, it's 50-50. So currently we're using 50-50 year leases and 50% are, uh, yeah, sales. Okay. And respectively, what comes from the online shop and what comes from the in-store sales? 
Um, the majority of our sales uh, come from our online so store. Uh, okay. I believe it's about 80%, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Perfect, thank you. No worries. Uh, sorry, guys, two seconds. Great. Um, and, and Claire. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is regarding consumer waste. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is focused on how important do you value that your consumers do not throw out your jeans? Well, of course, they can swap it. But do you stimulate them in any other way to make responsible choices regarding their pieces of clothing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is the core of our business um, where really our objective is to demonstrate that it is possible to live in a world without waste. And we do this through denim with the jeans production, right? To demonstrate that circularity does work, particularly in the fashion industry. So um, the dirtiest part of the fashion industry, of course, aside from you can also find a lot of waste in the production process, is the fact uh, of the linear aspect of, of, of fashion, right? Which is make, use and throw away. Um, particularly the fast paced of this, where customers and people are just in a faster rate, as you might probably know, purchasing a lot, wearing it a few times and throwing it away. So what we wanna do is actually uh, incentivize um, you know, a slower uh, consumption of clothes um, and with our lease model, incentivize our customers to send back the pair of jeans. What we're doing is uh, also challenging the idea of ownership. So by stating that we're leasing those jeans to them, we're saying we are lending you this fabric that we have invested in, in the shape of jeans so that um, you can enjoy it. You can enjoy the experience of having this new garment. But at the end of life of that product, we want it back. Um, and for us, that, that is essential. So we do incentivize our customers with uh, discounts after they return their jeans, whether they're leasers or pur purchasers. Um, and yeah, that is primarily how we try to, to communicate that. Uh, and not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, it's all clear. Thank you. Okay, super. Um, Danita. Danita, are you there? <laughs> All right, Danita, I'll move on, but if you're still there, let me know later. Uh, Lisa. Hi. Um, well, I'm Lisa. I'm a student now currently studying at supply chain management, and I'm investigating how fashion businesses in the fashion industry can become more transparent. So then in the end, of course, they can become more of a sustainable business. Um, but my biggest question is if companies like yours uh, are very transparent about their whole processes and the chain, how can they, as one player in the chain, uh, add enough value to stay relevant in the chain? Um, okay, I think I understand your question. Well, we stayed relevant because we're pioneers in this type of industry, in this type of product, circular denim, right? And um, we are transparent because it's part of our business structure and um, values. And at the end of the day, we have found that actually transparency is what builds trust, not only with our supply chain partners, because it creates a great transparency in prices and how we do things and how we interact with our supply chain partners. So it builds a more of a partnership, which is uh, very different to the relationship that actually many brands have with their supply chain partners, which is one of more pressuring them to for lower prices and faster production. And it's not really how we interact with our supply chain partners. But also more importantly, 
this transparency, it's what leads to more trust with our customers. Um, and that's how we retain our customers and grow as a brand. Um, and of course, also what keeps us as pioneers in the industry is all of our efforts to continue to be more circular every time and to push innovation in circular production. Uh, we do this through many projects, such as our Road to 100 project, which is, for example, a project where we want to make a pair of jeans that is 100% made from post-consumer recycled denim. But also we have our life cycle analysis where we calculate the, the impact of every single style in our collection and share that with our customers. All of these things uh, just demonstrate a genuine effort in, in being transparent and being an ethical brand. Um, and sets us as pioneers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I was just wondering like if there's a competitor that goes on your website and sees all your information, how can you uh, still be different from them even though they have the information? Do you get my? Yeah, um, of course. And a lot of people ask us this. So guys, why do you not keep all of the, the knowledge that you guys have to yourselves? Yeah. It's what makes you competitive, right? But that's not what we're interested in. Um, we share everything we learn because we want to inspire others to do exactly the same thing. Because as more companies can um, approach their businesses in a circular way, whether they're denim or not, the better it is for the whole environmental climate change objective um, that we have. So I, I understand what you mean. Once if we share everything, we can't be competitive. But the truth is that it's it's very much a journey. And so anyone can come in and start, but they will need to catch up and it's a process. Um, and if other there's going to be other circular brands and you'll see that there is increasingly more. There's organic basics. Slowly Levi's also wants to be circular, et cetera, et cetera. But for us, what's interesting is to continue to be pioneers and to be that you have to actually have a journey to go through. So, so your competitive advantage is not keeping your knowledge uh, all by yourself, but sharing it and also becoming like the first mover advantage of being the first and already uh, further along the journey than everyone else. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. That was my question. <laughs> Super. Uh, oh, Ed. Ed, are you there? Okay, moving on. Uh, Malin? Oh, I'm sorry. I think you were calling for me because my screen name is my first name, the first letter of my first name and the first letter. Oh, <laughs> yeah, could be. <laughs> I just see the names here as, as they come. Yeah, hi. Nice to meet hi. you. Nice to meet you. So, so what is your name? Sorry. My name is uh, Esma. Oh, Esma. Super Esma. Thanks. Uh, tell me your question, please. Um, honestly, as for now, I don't really have a question. I really like the previous question asked because that's also something I find really interesting in how business is really trying to communicate um, that they're really being honest and open towards their consumers uh, and in the way they do that because um, I feel that uh, as a customer, you can see when it's very genuine. I feel like you can really tell that even though it's not always uh, perceived in that way, that that's really depends on your personal, um, uh, yeah, your own thoughts. Um, but yeah, thank you for explaining. Super. No, my pleasure. I hope, I hope I'm answering all your questions um, in the way that you guys need it. So yeah, please don't, don't be shy. Um, yeah. All right, sorry, Who, where was I? Um, oh. uh, Lisa, I think you already went, right? So it's um, Michelle, Mikkel? Hi, it's Michael, yeah. Michael, sorry, <laughs> I was hesitant. I <laughs> know, oh, it's fine. Um, so I was wondering, how do you pick who your suppliers are? So so are there certain certain nations that you 
that you have in mind from the start or is it more general? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the first part of your question? Something about our suppliers, um, but it got cut out. Yeah, so how do you pick who your suppliers are? Yeah, so yeah, we very consciously pick suppliers that have the same values that we have. Um, this goes with sustainability efforts, but also social uh, standards. So how they treat their employees, the type of uh, regulations they have in place, uh, audits, et cetera. But uh, to be very transparent with you, we have a very short supply chain and we do this on purpose. So the majority of our production, uh, so we have four main supply chain partners. Um, three are based in Spain. So they are Recover, Ferre, and Tejido Froyo. Um, Recover recycles our, our jeans. Ferre turns that recycled fiber and um, spins it into a new yarn. Uh, and then Tejido Froyo um, dyes these new yarns and makes a new fabric. Um, so you might already know this, but all of our jeans have a composition between 23 and 40% post-consumer recycled cotton. And what's really excellent is that these three supply chain partners work very much together. And that's very important for us because we always wanna push innovation in the fabrics that we're using and the quantity of post-consumer recycled cotton that we want in our fabrics. So um, yeah, that was done very much on purpose. And then our fourth supplier is Eustex International, and they're based in Tunisia. And um, again, very much on purpose. It's actually quite close. It's just right across. Uh, so all of our goods can move on ground or on ship. So they don't have to travel long distances, but the way they travel are also um, carried out in a sustainable way. And that's about it. We have some fabrics that come from Turkey, um, but this is a very small percentage. This is about 70, uh, 7% of our production. Um, and, and that's about it. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have specific questions from-, from yeah, I was, yeah, I was um, uh, wondering about Turkey. In, yeah, so, so what do they yeah, produce exactly for you? Uh, Turkey also fabrics. So they make specific fabrics for us. Uh, actually, it's just the one fabric. And from there, we, we make a couple of styles. Um, but they are the same. So uh, they are produced with post-consumer recycled cotton. Um, and all of the processes take place in one location. So that's also really interesting for us. Um, and, and we do that so, again, we can... Um, lower the impact of that production instead of having multiple locations and things have to move um, many, many times over. Also in Eustex International, so all of our genes are made in Eustex International, 100% of them, and that's on purpose, uh, again. So, and the facility is a washing and a stitching facility in one location. Um, and this again is very unique because most brands actually have the stitching in one location and the washing in another location. Um, and all of these things sum up to produce a product with a very low environmental impact. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Malin? Yes, hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I'm conducting some research about textile uh, recycling in the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard already about the um, consumer side and expectation that you have. So what I would uh, like to talk now is um, that I believe the circularity and sustainability motivation comes mostly from the brand itself. Um, but we are expecting in the next five to 10 years a more um, yeah, change on the political side. So we are going to introduce a separate mandatory collection of textiles and also the extended producer responsibility. So how do you think that will um, affect margins and the collection of textiles and the business model? 
Yeah, we, uh, you're, you're spot on. There's a lot of policy work taking place right now. There's the Green Deal, particularly in the Netherlands. There's a lot of work. We are part of um, an initiative called the Denim Deal. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Um, basically, it's an initiative that is being pushed by the Dutch government, uh, currently only focused in the Netherlands. But uh, they have brought around the table all of the key players uh, that are involved in uh, post-consumer recycled content. So, sorry, let's reverse a second. The objective of this initiative is uh, to have all the denim brands in the Netherlands um, use at least 5% post-consumer recycled cotton in their jeans. And um, this is a huge impact, which would mean that there would be a significant increase of the use of post-consumer recycled cotton. Um, but what's interesting from it is that also it brings around the table all the recyclers, sorters, um, mills, everyone. So that's really interesting. Um, and I mentioned this just as a concrete example of our um, approach and motivation to form part of these type of discussions and initiatives. I think we have a lot to say. We have a lot to um, yeah, share with other brands or companies that are interested to start doing this. Um, we have just learned a lot since the beginning uh, of, of this brand. So again, our role is very much as pioneers and, and just trying to help others uh, do the same. OK, thank you. Bro. Um, and Natasha, Natasha, I don't know if that's a misspell. Natasha? No, it's Natasha. Natasha. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm a colleague of Adrienne uh, that you heard uh, at the beginning. Ah, super. Uh, because we have uh, very few uh, the chance to, uh, to ask a few questions. Um, we are more interested also in the background of financial um part of your business but i'm not sure if it's possible to find those informations also somewhere else can we see something about financials there is somewhere in your in your uh, site is not available but i'm not sure is that possible no 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 uh, it's not on our website no no but the, those kinds of informations uh, you don't share uh with uh, uh, uh it's not it's not public i mean no it's not no. public um not because we don't want to. I think it's just currently, yeah. But sorry, go ahead and ask your question. And if it's very specific, I can. No, it's more, uh, I'll try the first one and maybe we have a chance to uh, ask more questions. It's about, uh, the first thing is uh, about your investments. Uh, mm -hmm. How large are your investments and, and uh, what are you investing in? Uh, and how do you see the future with, uh, in combination with the rest investments that you are doing? Yeah, currently we're not, uh, so yeah, Bert is the better person to ask, answer this question, but I'll, I'll do my best for my knowledge and maybe you want to interact with him uh, more via email, but we're still growing. Um, and in fact, we have investors uh, that invested about $1 million in our company um, to help us grow and reach uh, a level of profit. So uh, in terms of actual financial investment, um, we are working more, most on our website, um, improving that customer experience um, and improving also the logistics aspect of our business uh, through better platforms as such. Um, th those are the main areas uh, of, of physical financial investment. Currently, particularly this year, the new website is from 2020. So uh, yeah. Then, for example, in terms of uh, time of our um, employees, the Road to 100 project uh, is one where we are investing significant amount of time and effort. Um, and but from there, we also have a separate financial investor that has come part of that. Um, yeah. Those are, there, those are mainly the areas that I see the main areas of investment. Again, maybe it's better, you might get some more specific details from Bert. Um, but we will try, actually we sent a mail about some questions uh, and asking them, asking him, but okay. Uh, I hope that we get those answers. And if there is some more time, I would like to still uh, to ask more questions, but uh, I'll 
let first uh, the other ones. Okay. And maybe there is more time. Thank you. No worries. Um, Nienke? Uh, it's Nienke, but... Uh, Nienke, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, thank you for your time. Nice. And my question is regarding the labels in the uh, genes, because uh, labels are still a huge barrier for the textile recycling. Mm -hmm. And a printed pattern or text on a garment could fade uh, after a while, and the uh, letter labels on the waist uh, remain uh, clearly visible uh, a long time. Uh, so how do you ensure that the printed labels remain visible for as long as possible? Yeah, that is a challenge. Our labels are, so most of our labels are cotton. Some of them are still um, satin, satin. Uh, so that is a poly mix. And I think that there remains the situation that with the, the poly mix, the, the labels remain readable for longer. Um, when it comes to recycling our genes, this doesn't create a huge burden or issue actually, um, because the, our genes are already a high percentage of cotton, whether it's recycled or organic. So when it comes to our circularity mission, it, it doesn't prevent much there. But it's really interesting your question about labels because that is something on my to-do list as sustainability manager. How can we do that better? Um, there is a lot of talk about exchanging it into a type of RFID type of thing um, or a QR code type of thing. Um, but that obviously goes with its own obstacles along the way um, and regulations that need to be followed, right? So I don't have a concrete answer for you. I think that the label issue is the same as, as um, yeah, many brands face. The more you wash it, the more it fades right um but the i to to ask you to answer your question directly in terms of what we're using it's that the majority are cotton labels uh with exception if you have a pair of my jeans you'll see like the the front label is a satin um mix but if if you have your own pair of my jeans you'll notice that the more you wash them especially after one year they'll start fading okay yeah thank you and it's clear Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Mikos. Yep. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, uh, we're doing a research in a few months ago in Germany about the uh, return program in the fashion industry. Um, and so we want to ask about, uh, yeah, about your return program. Uh, if uh, the consumers are really interested that and what is the success rate and how you motivate your consumers to, in order to do this return program uh, sorry so we yeah okay i am you're coming in and out so but i think you're asking me how we motivate our consumers for the rental program correct yeah yeah okay yeah. super uh and, yeah and also sorry and also the return program i mean like when they they bring the old uh, on your company so because you, you also take back the jeans that they already have. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So we take back not only mud jeans, but we also take back uh, in general other jeans that they may have uh, as long as they're 98% cotton. That's the, that's the trick. So yeah, that's very much the incentive to minimize the amount of uh, denim waste in the world, so to speak. Um, we don't want our genes or other genes to be incinerated. At the end of the day, it's valuable material. So the way that we incentivize them is uh, primarily through discounts. Um, so when they return a pair, when they, uh, yeah. So when you're purchasing a pair of jeans or leasing it, you can click and say, I want to return a pair. And that will either give you a one month uh, free of your lease or a 10 euro discount if you're purchasing. Um, so that's sort of the biggest financial uh, sort of incentive to returning those genes. Um, and the idea is, of course, that once you receive your genes, you have that box, you can try on your genes. If they fit well, fantastic. If you need to exchange them, you can use the same box, not only to exchange your genes, but also send back the, the old genes that you no longer want and 
we have a free return label also. This depends where you're based. So um, it is limited to certain countries where you have the free return for your genes. Um, and interestingly, having that free return is one of the biggest incentives for customers wanting to return their old genes. Along with that, it's a lot of part of our thir the third pillar of our strategy, which is positive activism, which is very much focused on sharing our knowledge and being very open about our efforts and the things that we do. Um, as you can imagine, this is very much linked to our marketing efforts, right? So our, our Instagram and social media platforms do a lot of work um, on educating our customers into the value and impact of recycling your genes or preventing your genes from going uh, onto in incineration or uh, other waste streams. Um, that is primarily how we how we do it. And, and then of course, um, we do a lot of these type of talks where we work with students and other organizations where we share this type of information. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah, and the last slide, uh, there's a success rate on that, uh, how you measure the success rate on uh, the return program, or it's it not a, or a KPI for you, the return program? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, over the years, it's improved, right? So in fact, I believe it was in 2020 that we hit the 50-50, meaning 50% uh, rental or yeah, leasing and 50% uh, purchasing. And over the years, what we want to do is increase that. Um, it is a KPI in the sense, we don't have a percentage of success rate, so to speak, but we do want to increase that percentage over the years to have more and more people rent uh, their jeans. But this is the important part also to mention that even if you buy your jeans, you are still incentivized to return those jeans at the end of their life. And we do this because every pair of jeans, when they're sent, they have a booklet in the back pocket where it's, it explains the concept, but also requests the customer um, to send back the, the genes. And actually there's like an agreement and a lot of our customers actually sign that agreement. Um, and of course it's not binding, but it's a concept of accepting that responsibility and they send that back to us. Um, and it just builds that relationship with the customer when they do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, super, uh, Raya, sorry again for the mispronunciations, guys. <laughs> you said it correct, thank you. Um, I'm currently doing research on how the uh, circular economy can help um, create a more sustainable fashion industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my question is, uh, what kind of challenges do you think the brand will face uh, in regards to sustainability in the future? Well, so at the moment, we're doing quite well in terms of sustainability. Um, so we measure our impact, we track it, we also set goals uh, for the year to follow and also 2030. Um, and so compared to industry standard, for example, our genes use 70% um, less CO2 and 93% less water. And all of these things make um, an important impact. Here's the challenge. The more and more you improve and you have that difference and you lower your impact, the harder it is gonna be each year to make further impact. Um, that is the biggest challenge. When it comes to sustainability, you want to respect the boundaries of the planet. Um, but at one point, can you no longer reduce that impact any further? We haven't gotten there yet, but you know, the more we do this, the, the harder that's going to be, um, which then raises a really big question of how sustainable can a company be in terms of fully sustainable or fully circular, um, th those are the challenges on how exactly we can do that. Of course, you can offset, you can be carbon positive. We're doing all of those things. Um, but again, it's, it's that aspect of being and working fully within 
the boundaries of the planet and doing that in the best way possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Super. Um, all right. Um, Rian? Yes, hello. Hi. <laughs> so I am researching for a small high-end women's fashion brand and they upcycle post-consumer textile waste uh, and they also use certified fabrics in their garments. So they don't use recycled fabrics, just really the, yeah, the, the garments as they were gathered, so to say. And uh, my question is, do you think a business model like that could have a negative impact on another party? So hold on one second. When you mean, explain to me again the type of fabrics. So are they dead stock fabrics or? Yes, they are dead stock, but also, uh, for example, when uh, a consumer doesn't want a certain garment anymore, they can bring it to a recycling center. Mm -hmm. This brand takes the uh, waste, so to say, the, the fabrics from, from a recycling center and then upcycles them into new garments. I think sounds really cool. I mean, <laughs> yeah, your question is, you know, how can this have a negative impact, right? Is that what you were asking me? Yes, exactly. Um, well, I don't, from the top of my head, I don't see anything. Uh, I mean, you have to look into, um, but this wouldn't be necessarily a, a negative thing, but more an area of improvement as you build your company or your business is how the fat, how the fabrics are made. Uh, sorry, how you use those fabrics and the type of resources that are being used in that in that production. So, um, are using renewable energy and and these type of things, and that's really to optimize the sustainability aspect of your business. But the fact that you're you, that you're using dead stock fabrics or fabrics that are, you know no longer uh, in the interest of individuals and that would most likely end up uh, being part of waste, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But here's the trick. Also, if you wanna build a circular business, is you have to ask whether those fabrics can then um, be re-recycled. So if you're aiming for a circular business, that tends to be the trick because while, while they can be downcycled or upcycled, you know, does that garment then have an end of life, um, just an extended end of life where it will anyways at the end end up as waste, then that's a flaw or a limitation to the business design that you have. And actually, a lot of businesses have this where they try to use, I don't know, plastic bottles to make t-shirts, but then can those t-shirts be recycled again? Most of the time, no. So it will anyways end up in a landfill. Um, yeah, those are a little bit the bottlenecks I see from a quick discussion. <laughs> yeah, so it's really uh, making sure that after, so to say, the, the second life of the fabric that it can still have a third life and a fourth life, et cetera. Exactly. And so from there, you can think about um, whether the types of fabrics that you're using. So. I mean, more and more there's facilities potentially available that can recycle fabrics that are composed of multiple materials. But my advice would try to stick with monomaterials. So to your cottons or cellulose-based cellulose fibers so that they can be recycled and remade into something new. Okay, thank you so much. Sure, I hope that helps. Um, okay, guys, sorry, bear with me. Uh, Sharon. Hello, yes, I'm Sharon, and I have a question based on the case that I saw in collaboration with IKEA with mm -hmm. the sofa cover. Did yep. you receive uh, other requests from large fashion companies already? Uh, no, not so far. Uh, IKEA was really born from a collab uh, from a uh, interview that we did um, where IKEA was present, Majinus was present, and the interviewer suggested that we should do a collaboration with them because IKEA has circularity as key targets in their in their mission. So it was suggested and it just kind of um, sparked that collaboration and it went from there on. 
And do you think in the future that there will be also some collaboration with other companies to, yeah, to make more impact in the whole uh, industry? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Never say never. I don't think, I mean, we started with IKEA and, and again, very much part of our motto, we like to work with companies to where they're trying to dip their toe in the water, so to speak, when it comes to circularity and try full circularity or circularity at the level that we're working at. So, um, yeah, we're more than happy to to work in those type of collaborations. So I don't see why not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, sure, no problem. Um, Sifan, sorry, again, if I'm butchering your name. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, Stefania? Or Stefania? Are you there? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I enjoy very much uh, the guest lecture today. All the information is very interesting and I'm really into sustainability. And uh, it's very nice to hear more uh, aspects about the business that is um, actually in this field. Yeah. And uh, I was curious, um, maybe how everything started, like uh, what was the idea behind uh, behind it, how this business started? Yeah, because I think it's very interesting and yeah. Yeah, so uh, Bertrand Son, he's the founder of, of Majins and you know before Majins he had already about 10 years of experience in the industry the fashion industry and had seen sort of the very dark sides of the industry, both from a social and environmental perspective. So when he set off to um, create a, uh, a company like Mudjeans, what he wants to do is demonstrate that there can very much be an alternative to the fast fashion uh, standard, uh, not only in the way of conducting your business from a values perspective, but um, but also how you interact with your supply chain partners, um, but also most importantly from the business model. Um, and what I mean by that, our circular business model. Um, and so from there on, he started challenging, you know, he wanted to first challenge, as I mentioned before, this idea of ownership. Um, you know, does the customer have to be uh, the owner of that garment, of that fabric? And if not, uh, how can we get that garment back? So from those two questions, very much the whole thing launched and um, yeah, and, and Mudjeans was born in 2014, I believe, then the Lisa, uh, Lisa Jeans model really came into place and, and Mudjeans uh, as how it is known today um, was very much structured. I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. Yes, sure. All right. So, um, uh, so as I understood, it wasn't like um, much based on the research. Then it was on um, answering those two, those two questions and the need to answer them, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was more based on what what he had seen in, in, in the past and wanted to make a difference um, with his own company, just. All right, yeah, so it was basically uh, mainly based on his experience and yeah, I think this is great. Thank you. Super. Uh, Tam? Hi. Hi, nice to Hi. meet you. <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. Uh, I have a question like, um, do you have any uh, challenge why organizing the uh, supply chain for the circular because like you have to collect back the uh, the chains right and then transfer it to the company and like do you have any other um, like face with like uh, supply shortages because uh, um, some of like the, the fabric is made from uh, 20 to 30 40 percent of cycle cotton so like do you have ever have like shortage of cycle cotton for the production? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Tam. Um, so to answer your question. So for example, um, we have a very short supply chain. Again, I, I spoke about this before, but yeah. that helps us a lot um, mm -hmm. because we can have very direct interaction with our supply chain partners. Um, and so, yes, we at the beginning, we had to find, for example, a logistics partner that could deal with our approach. So not all logistics partners are comfortable with customers sending back old jeans and, um, you know, what do they do with those? They have to also store it there. And of course, there's the challenge of collecting all of those and sending them back to Spain. Um, mm -hmm. That is, uh, that is a challenge in itself, finding, again, transportation companies that can take that amount back to Spain um, because it's not a huge amount. You would think, okay, they must have problems with quantities in terms of because it's so much. But actually, when it comes to these transportation companies, they're used to carrying so much that yeah. finding someone that wants to take the amount that we have is sometimes uh, a challenge. And um then to answer your question about like post-consumer cycle cotton specifically we haven't um, found particular challenges in in shortages so uh recover they they recycle our genes but if there isn't enough of our genes they will incorporate the recycled content of other genes that they collected and they collect genes um within the European region um, and we use that. Of course, as more and more brands start using post-consumer recycled cotton, that might be a challenge in the future. Um, but I have to say that the cost of post-consumer recycled cotton is quite high. Um, and that's also one of the reasons uh, why many brands are still hesitant towards using mm, it. Okay. Um, and then apart from that, you know, there, there hasn't really been uh, any big sort of obstacles, um, again, because everything's quite close to each other. Yeah. So that also really helps us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, you're welcome. So clear. Yeah. Uh, Suleya? Okay, her microphone doesn't work. Sorry, I'm just reading. Okay, so um, my question is actually already answered partially. It was about how you turn your business model into circular, or perhaps my genes uh, started circular from the beginning. And this is how the idea of renting is created. Yep, that's how. Mm -hmm. And after someone asked about this, and I was curious to know how you have found how you have found your investors. Um, yeah, I as to how we found our investors, they're Dutch based investors, and uh, they're investors specifically in sustainability, or they have an obligations to invest in sustainable businesses, um, and that's primarily how. Uh, we created that relationship. Exactly how that was done, um, I'm sorry, I, I cannot comment on that as I was not particularly involved in that process. Um, all right, guys, hold on. Let me quickly go up to Adrian. Adrian, I know I, I skipped you at the beginning. So if you have your question, please feel free to uh, ask it now. Yeah, thank you that you're coming back. Um, uh, some of our questions are answered in between, uh, but there's left a question about your ambitions. Uh, what are the ambitions from Margins uh, from yeah from now on to 2030? <laughs> uh, yeah, so specific ambitions are, for example, from an environmental perspective, we have set specific targets that we want to meet. Um, and we are about to launch. So you can see those in the 2019 um, sustainability report and LCA report, the exact values of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and also to keep growing. Of course, uh, we don't have the objective to be the next Zara or um, something of the sort, but we of course want to keep growing so that we can make Mudjeans more accessible to the general public. Um, and that is very much an objective uh, that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we are not yet hitting profit. So hitting that profit margin and keep growing to a significant size uh, is, is the objective. And um, yeah, keep, we want to continue to be circular and push further the boundaries of being circular. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, right now we use still up to 40% post-consumer cotton, but we actually want to reach 100%. And this is one of the big targets and it will be a significant step for us to reach that um, even bigger level of circularity and it will significantly reduce our environmental impact in the process as well, because we will start using only recycled content and we will not depend so much on the virgin material. Mm -hmm. Do you think the organization is scalable for in the future? Yeah, of course. Um, but like, as I mentioned, we don't have the intention to grow to a scale that matches that of of some of the bigger fast fashion companies. Um, we don't think that is aligned with our values, but we definitely want to reach uh, um, a high level where we can still have some influence and, and a louder speaking voice in the industry. Mm -hmm. but, um, but what I'm thinking of is uh, imagine there's a, a company like Levi's or no, yeah, someone like that, that's not uh, that, that far as much jeans is with uh, sustainable uh, uh, cotton jeans. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that's bigger, that, that's, that's a big name. Um, imagine that comes around and uh, ask you, we want to take over, oh, I ask you, <laughs> uh, we want to take over you. Uh, what does that mean for the sustainability? Yeah, I, well, I'm the sustainability manager, so I cannot really comment on whether or not we would be in the place to sell mud jeans to a company like, like Levi's. But um, within the mandate of mud jeans, mm -hmm. it is written the values that need to be followed. So when you are a B Corp, you have to adjust your mandate so that all of your business objectives consider your share, uh, your stakeholders. So, um, sorry, your shareholders. So it's, it includes your customers, your suppliers, your, everyone that's involved, your, your own employees. And in that, um, we would maintain our sustainable values. That aside, I think when you sell your company to a bigger company, it is very likely that your values are diluted into theirs and you lose a lot the essence of, of the original company. So, and I would be very surprised to see if my jeans would ever do something like that in the future, particularly because we push so much towards being pioneers and, and drivers of circular denim. But like I said, that's just my personal opinion um, and not the opinion of the company. Okay, thank you. It's, um, if I have understand it right, um, uh, you, you, Mud Jeans doesn't think um, they can their uh, code of conduct uh, make bigger by uh, uh, in a company as, as Levi's or another. Yeah, no. It, it works the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do. We want to incentivize Levi's to be like mud jeans, if that's at all possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Have I skipped anyone? Did anyone not get the opportunity to ask their question? If so, please speak. <laughs> Yeah, I actually had a question. I also put that in the comment section. Go but, for it. Um, yeah, so um, my friend and I, a couple of years, tried to uh, run a circular economy, well, a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it failed. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so my question is, would you can, can you can you maybe give us some advice on how to um, convince potential customers um, to um, yeah believe in our ideas? Because um, I think the la it was lack of convincing potential customers. It was actually pretty a good idea, but um, we actually uh, were lack in yeah convincing uh, uh, people. So. You know, a lot of actually, I talk about this with Bert. Uh, well, we've spoken about this. It's a lot to do with timing. And, you know, he says a lot that when Mudgeons was first born, so to speak, um, the culture of sustainability and sustainable fashion wasn't quite there. I mean, of course, there's people that supported the concept, but it wasn't trending, if I want to speak in the Instagram lingo, you know, it, it wasn't trending. It wasn't being adapted and thought of by the standard customer. Um, but increasingly, and I'm sure if you are in sustainability world and, and you're interested in this, you have probably noticed that there is a huge sort of, um, you know, momentum that is now following not only sustainability, but sustainability and fashion specifically. Yeah. Um, you have this green deal, you have actual uh, within the green deal. Also, the textile industry is a main part that is within that. Um, but, you know, within the tragic of everything that is COVID, that has also accelerated a lot more the uh, understanding from a customer, the importance of caring about the environment with everything that you do. Um, so, you know, I'm not telling you to go and start your business again, but I think that if you want to go and start a new sustainable business, this might be a better time for you than maybe when you first started it, because there is sort of the atmosphere there now. And, and, um, I think the consumer is far more open to it because you have some of the bigger brands. You can also tell some of the bigger brands talking about this so they're educated uh, on what is sustainable fashion circular fashion etc but to answer your question directly how to convince them you know this is also a, a big part of the positive activism pillar of our strategy and it's just communication continuous communication and our communication and marketing content is very much with the purpose of educating and empowering our customers, sharing information about sustainability, and in a fun and light way, of course, explaining why it is important. Um, and that's the trick, the balance between highlighting the importance and making it still light and interacting, because the last thing that people want, and this is really tricky, is that unfortunately, you know, it's really depressing, the whole climate change thing so yeah. um that is that is the biggest struggle there um yeah i don't know if that answered your i, yeah, I don't have was... a, like a final you know i don't have like a concise answer as to how you can convince your customers but that's at least the way that we're doing it or trying to do it is just by being genuine but again i think that the customers and and the type of people that you'll be able to interact with is much broader now than it was before okay well yeah you you answered my question uh thank you thank you very much <laughs> you're welcome uh natasha you're welcome to ask the question directly and i think that will be the the last question of today uh, I was uh, now a lot of questions, but I was wondering what we talked about uh, the, the purpose of the business and everything, but I've heard nothing about you, uh, the people who are working for, for Mal Jeans. Um, <laughs> it's about the structure of the, of the company and uh, what's your position in a company besides the function and what kind of culture uh, are you, uh, you have within a company? Yeah, I love that question. So yeah, my position is CSR manager and my function is really to take what is Mudjeans. I mean, it's very easy to have that position, so to speak, in a company like Mudjeans because the core of the business is circular. So what I try to do is take a look at everything that we have and develop a strategy to push further and do better. So I work 
with our suppliers, I work with our product developer, I work with everyone so that they also know how we're improving and how we're doing better because then they're more interactive with the business itself and um, yeah, communicate that with our customers and our retailers, et cetera. The culture of the company, it's a very open um, culture, so to speak. We are quite multicultural in terms of the nationalities that are present in the team. Um, we have a very open space um, office, well, back, back before COVID, we would all hang out there. Um, and uh, yeah, everyone sort of, you know, I do sustainability, but you know, when you have to help with customer service, you have to help with customer service because we're a small team. So everyone is doing a little bit of everything um, because um, we are still in scale up mode. We are about 12 to 14 employees. It depends how you're counting. And also we always have some new interns and things like that. Um, so yeah, but so when you're choosing, uh, when you want to scale up and you're choosing uh, for new people, what's the, the main, um, besides a person and personality and, and expertise uh, and experts uh, that you are bringing, of the person brings, what's more important to choose someone? What are the criteria that you are using to say, okay, you are the one? Yeah. Uh, thinking about the, the, the mode of mod, mod genes, who are you and where are you and why are you on earth? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think from if I see similarities with, between the team members, it's very much people that obviously have a passion for sustainability um, and, and have that within their values and sort of an area that they want to work in or work towards. Um, but then apart from that, I really see a really mix of personalities. Um, and and cultures um, and somehow it, it all works really well together and you, you said uh, there are 12 to 14 people yeah. at, at, at the moment uh, bart bert is uh, a senior of, of the founder mm -hmm. uh, and you also have all your roles uh, and do you you said just that you also communicate with other colleagues uh, from other departments uh, at the moment so it's basically really flat the structure very flat yeah very very flat exactly short short lines and a flat structure mm -hmm. yeah and so it's very easy and quick to make decisions um so you have the four main founders that includes bert and three others and then the rest is uh, is other employees and it's a very flat structure there's really not much hierarchical um presence there in the daily daily business yeah all right thank you very much thank no you problem. all right guys thank you so much uh for all of your questions i hope i managed to answer them uh yeah the hour went really fast we're five minutes over so we'll leave it at that but um if you have more questions you can always join us next month uh, we're always happy to answer more um, and if you have very specific questions, you can maybe send it to info at mudgeens.eu and either myself or another colleague will, will make sure to get back to you. Can I just ask one more question about uh, former uh, QAs or former uh, sessions that you had? Is it possible to find them somewhere on internet or? or, or uh, can yeah, you can request them. them. Request them. All and right. then we will send you all the links for those. We're happy to to send you that oh, okay because uh, i saw a few but i was not sure if there are more yeah uh, and what uh, all right okay thank you no problem bye everyone bye